Hey folks, Dr. Mike here for Renaissance Periodization. I have a question for you. Should you be wearing a lifting belt? Maybe. Good news, we also have answers. Here we go. For strength and hypertrophy training, is a lifting belt a good idea? We're actually gonna break down the discussion into a couple of subpoints. First, what does a belt do? Uh, goes over your body. <laughs> we know that, but what does it do physiologically, anatomically, so on and so forth? And that's going to have implications for when it's a good idea, when it's a bad idea. Then we're going to talk about when a belt is not a good idea, when it's a great idea, and what kind of belt is good, especially depending on your training age. So here we go. What does a belt do? Fundamentally, a belt increases your intra-abdominal pressure, and it does this when you put it on for lifting, and it does it especially if you know how to brace into the belt. So if you have a belt on, it should be nice and tight. Then you breathe in and you push out against the belt. It's like pushing out against your own abs, except now your abs are unbreakable. And that allows the internal pressure, your intra-abdominal, intra-thoracic, so on and so forth, all that pressure to be much higher. By itself, that sounds like a neat trick that has no point whatsoever, but increase in intra-abdominal pressure has some really, really cool effects. First, it allows for more spinal stability at any given load, which automatically, at a very high load, reduces the chance of injury or reduces the chance that your technique sort of skirts off and you have lower power production than you miss a repetition. So first benefit. Secondly, in an interesting pathway, when you have a high degree of spinal stability because of a high degree of intra-abdominal pressure from the belt, what actually ends up happening is your nervous system allows more neural drive to go to the periphery. For example, if you put on a belt and you brace properly into it, the amount of force you can generate with your quads, glutes, and hamstrings actually goes up. When your body detects a huge amount of spinal stability and a huge amount of intra-abdominal pressure causing that, it actually sort of disinhibits its own neural drive to the quads, glutes, hams, etc. And now you can push and pull harder with your legs. The same effect also works for your upper body, but it really works well with your legs. When your body, especially for your legs, detects spinal instability, it caps how much of neural drive it sends to your legs, and then you can't push as hard as you otherwise would. Ultimate example of this is when you're squatting on a BOSU ball and everything's wiggly, you literally can't produce a whole lot of force with your legs. Putting on a belt is the polar opposite of squatting on a BOSU ball. It makes everything rigid, tight, and your spinal column is just like this. Your body can tell, and it allows higher forces to be transmitted, which means you could lift more with a belt than without a belt. And that means that you also get potentially better stimulus to the local muscles, like your quads can get literally more out of every set because you can contract them harder more fully than you would without a belt, without that extra added stability. Now, this is especially true if you're used to wearing the belt. You put on a belt for the first two, three, or four times, and, ugh, it feels weird, it's off, it may be pinching into you. There's usually no enhancement with a one-time, two- or three-time belt use. But as you learn to use the belt, your performance with the belt can really, really notably elevate, allowing you to stimulate those muscles of the lower body, especially upper body as well, more and to do so safely and produce higher forces, so on and so forth. In addition, if your core is a limiting factor on your lifts, a belt can reduce the limiting factor of your core. What do we mean by this? Let's say you can leg press a fuck ton with really good technique because your legs are really, really strong. But every time you do squats, your core, your back, let's say, is what's interfering. You may be able to do with your legs 12 reps, but you stop at like eight reps because you just start to fold over. Or you start to feel really weak because your core is super weak. If you put on a belt nice and tight and you know how to use it, it buys you two, three, four more reps before your core gets weak again because it reinforces your core. And all of a sudden, you can get closer to actual leg failure within a set than just having it limited by the core. Because people will be like, hey, you stop that set of squats, you're one from fail, do your legs feel like they're getting hit? You're like, honestly, I fucking don't. Like, it's just my back gets tired and I start folding over, my force production goes down, I can't do any more reps. You throw on a belt, you learn how to use it, and all of a sudden, someone says, hey, how was that set? And you're like, dude, it was fucking awesome. My core didn't prevent me from um, doing more reps. Like, my legs are failing now. They're the limiting factor, which is great because you get so much more out of your leg tree, right? Now, Putting on a belt has effects on core musculature. You might be thinking like, look, if we're throwing on a belt, 
isn't that a crutch? You're right to a certain extent. So at any absolute given load, 200 pound squat, 200 pound squat. Without a belt, core muscle activity is pretty high. With a belt, it's lower. And you think, fuck, if I use a belt at 200 pounds both times, I'm gonna actually be making my core muscles even weaker, making the problem worse. True. However, remember, a belt allows you to lift more weight. So if as a relative percent of your max, let's say 200 pounds, something you could do for sets of 10 without a belt. The real comparison isn't to say how core muscle activity does with 200 pounds. The answer is less if you put on a belt. The real comparison is, okay, your 10RM is 200, fine. Core muscle activity is a certain level. What if we check with your 10RM with the belt on? Okay. Now, after you learn how to use your belt, your 10 rep max isn't 200 anymore with a belt. It's still 200 without a belt. With a belt, it's 225, right? Or something like that. Now, what's your core muscle activity then? It's the same. So your core muscle activity, if you're trying just as hard, is the same with a belt or without a belt. So if you're trying super hard and not just using a belt as a literal crutch to just get the same reps you used to except without one, if you're really pushing yourself as hard as you ever were, the belt doesn't make your core muscles any weaker. It makes them just as strong as lifting without a belt did, period. Really, really cool, right? Now, lastly, another thing you can expect with the belt, and this is a big deal, is an ever so slight but notable change in technique, right? It's gonna take a bit to get used to. A lot of times people throw on a belt for the first time and they do a squat and they're like, what the fuck? Like their butt shoots back further. A lot of times what people will do is they'll flex or extend to the spine as they get lower in a squat, for example. And now that flexion or extension, because you have a belt around you, is not really possible. That your back is now more of a rigid segment. So instead of you know having your knees come up this way and you being able to flex and extend into it, now you're rigid and your knees do this and you're like, what the shit? So it's definitely something that takes some easing into. Don't just assume it's this magic tool that instantly makes you stronger. Some people are lucky and that's the effect they get. For most people, the first time they put on a belt, they may actually get weaker during that session than usual because their technique is thrown off. So remember that that's a really, really big deal. To that effect, when is a belt a bad idea? Okay. First bad idea for a belt is after peripheral injury. Okay. If you hurt your quad or you hurt your adductor, throwing on a belt is just going to let you put higher forces through your quad and your adductor. And that's a terrible, terrible idea. You don't need to put high forces and you need to put low forces. So the belt is really kind of completely pointless at this point. Worse than pointless, it can give you a false sense of confidence, and then you get hurt again. Bad news. Second, for beginners, people that have been only lifting for uh, you know one to three years, maybe one to two, belt isn't a good idea because we need to have them establish core awareness, learn how to brace properly using their own abs, and establish really good technique. In way too early reliance on a belt can never teach you how to brace. So if you ever take your belt off, you are fucking useless, and you have no idea how to do anything, and everything feels super, super weird. Also, when you're relatively weak, which all of us are when we're beginners, you don't need a fucking belt for safety or for anything else, right? You just don't. So in beginners, highly recommended, there's no belt used whatsoever. That answers probably a bunch of your questions. Next, when you're preparing for a non-belt exertion, if you have, an, uh, you know, if you're trying to test your beltless max in your deadlift or you have a competition in which a belt is not allowed or something like that, why in God's name would you wear a belt? You get used to wearing a belt. Then when you actually do the exertion itself, the competition, whatever is showing off, you don't get to wear a belt. It throws you off. It's really crazy. It's nothing good. You don't really ever train, especially in a peaking phase with anything you can't use in competition or in showing off. So if you've got like beltless deadlift effort coming up for the next month, take the belt off. Don't use it at all for the deadlift. Really, really, really good idea. Next one, point D. When you want to train your core as the limiting factor in a compound move, especially without needlessly fatigue in the periphery, don't wear a belt. So for example, some people will do overhead squats to get more core stability. They're using the overhead squat to enhance their core strength and stability. It's really great for that actually. If you throw on a belt, you just have to use more weight in your hands and then your shoulders hurt more, your legs are struggling more. You're not really training core stability. You're still training core stability, but at a bigger expense. If you don't throw on a belt, you get just as much core stability training, but with less external load, safety is actually up, so on and so forth. So if you really want your core to get stronger and stronger and stronger as a focus of your training, and you don't care about your periphery as much in that time, don't use a belt, right? Next one, and this is a huge one. I've made this mistake a bunch. If you've been training without a belt, 
and a competition is coming up very soon or it's the day of the competition, do not throw on a belt because there is a lag time for learning how to use it in most cases. Look, if it's your last deadlift attempt and you look at your coach and you're like, I just don't, you know, I want to get this attempt. Maybe you missed the second to last one and you're just like, look, I don't know. We got to pull a rabbit out of a hat. Is it okay to roll the dice and try a belt? Sure, sure. Are the dice always going to come up on the right side? No. Like sometimes you put on a belt, you start pulling on it, you're like, this is a fucking disaster. And sometimes you're like, oh, it gives me a little bit of an edge and a little bit of a placebo effect too as well. But generally speaking, if you got a competition coming up or some kind of effort where you're showing off, don't throw on a belt last minute. That's a really, really terrible idea, right? It oftentimes hurts more than helps. Lastly, for very high reps, the belt is usually not recommended because it makes your breathing more difficult and it also uh, sometimes restricts blood flow to and uh, from the legs. So it's a real bad deal. So if you're doing uh, reps of 20 plus, like I, I see people doing sets of 15, 20, 25 reps on a leg press and they have a belt on. The fucking God, God's name are you doing? And they're like, man, it's really hard to breathe. No fucking shit. You take the belt off and you can breathe again and you actually get more reps. Uh, this is something I have uh, encountered many, many times with hack squats and stuff. Sometimes I'll use a belt and cinch it really tight. And when I do sets of 20, I'm like, <gasps> I'm like, I, this isn't my legs anymore. I physically can't fucking breathe. I take the belt off and each rep feels harder because obviously it's lower intra-abdominal pressure, but I get more reps, right? And if the point is to get lots of reps, ta-da, kind of a self-solving problem. For those of you more advanced, you can modulate this problem incrementally by just cinching your belt not as tight or tighter. So if you've got high reps coming up, you can keep your belt on, but cinch it less tight. But just know that this is a thing no to expect. All right. When is a belt a good idea? First, when your core is limiting your periphery, like you're doing squats and lunges or overhead presses, and you know you're not failing because of your actual target muscles, you're failing because your core gets tired, gets weak, and throws you out of position. If that's the case, and you really want bigger quads or bigger shoulders or whatever you're actually targeting, throwing on a belt on is a really, really good idea, especially if you get a lot out of the belt. And if you don't get a lot out of the belt, a lot of times it's learning how to use the belt properly, which takes weeks and weeks. And then eventually you're like, oh my God, the belt is really doing wonders for me. Okay, so that's a really good use. Next, if your core cumulative fatigue is limiting your periphery. So yeah, you can actually do really well without a belt, but you're doing stiff-legged deadlift, deadlift, bent rows, squats, overhead presses, all the shit in the same week. And you're noticing like your core, like your back and everything, your abs, your, your, your obliques, they're getting really tired. And over time, not in any one session, but over time, your training degrades because your core is holding it back. If you throw on a belt every now and again and just do the same sets and reps you normally would, yeah, that actually fatigues your core less and you end up doing really well with it because the core isn't limiting the rest of your program on a systemic level. So sometimes you see people doing a belt on a bent row and you're like, what are you doing? Like, you don't need a belt for the bent row. Totally. But for them, it just takes the stress off their core just a little bit. And of course, we could accomplish that with just doing machines or something. But sometimes a belt is good just to take it easier on your core when you know your core is limiting factor in a cumulative sense. Next, this is kind of a no-brainer. When you're training for a competition, and a belt is allowed. Okay, duh, it's usually a good idea. It's a big advantage in most cases. Try to think of how many times you've seen World's Strongest Man. I highly recommend you watch it if you haven't. And they have that like 700 pound prefixed squat gigantic barbell challenge thing where they do as many squats with like 700 or whatever as possible. Think of how many of the guys don't use a belt. Almost everyone uses a belt because it's just a fucking big deal. As a matter of fact, in Strongman, they often have custom belts that are much wider and thicker than regular belts because it's that big of a deal. It's a huge deal. So if you have the opportunity to use it, use it. Sometimes you see people breaking world records and stuff, not as often world records, competing at national meets with no belt, like squat or deadlift. And you think like, damn, do we not need a belt? No, that person probably just like hasn't figured some shit out yet. A uh, really good example uh, by analogy is, I remember the Eric Lillibridge, I believe, used to squat high bar in competition and everyone kind of knew biomechanically low bar was better. And he was like, no, high bar feels good for me. And he was breaking tons of records doing it. And people were like, see, Eric does it like, Fucking high bar is the way to go. Low bar is a myth. It's fucking stupid. And then he transitioned to low bar. And within like a period of like six months, added like 200 pounds to a squat. <laughs> okay. Nothing else really changed. And people are like, oh, God damn it. So low bar works better and having a belt works better, which is why almost every squat world record is broken low bar with a fucking belt. So sometimes there's kind of a pride we have. I'm like, fuck, I don't need a belt. If you want your best possible performance, a belt is a really, really good idea. And... Some people say, you know, does a belt reduce injury risk? If you keep the loads to what they normally are, it almost certainly reduces injury risk to 
the area that it directly supports. So if you have kind of a back injury or something like that, can you throw on a belt and still have normal workouts? Sometimes yes. So that's the last point when you can lift pain-free with a belt, but you can't without one. However, that's a short-term fix with something to maybe get you through the end of a mesocycle or something. Like let's say you have Smith machine squats and it's week five of a five-week progression. And on week four, you kind of dinged your back a little bit and you're like, Ugh, and you were doing them beltless and you throw on a belt for week five and you do your warm-ups and you're like, ooh, actually this feels fucking great. Let's see how it feels without a belt. You try a warm-up without a belt. You're like, ow, 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 fuck that. Throw the belt back on, finish your sets with the ha- with the uh, Smith Machine squad, finish that out, but don't be like a permanent thing. Don't be like, yeah, ever since I hurt my back, I can't, can't squat without a belt. Like, holy fuck, that's a real serious injury. Sometimes that's permanent and sometimes you always have to have the belt. Very rarely. Usually a belt is a fine band-aid for a short time and eventually you have to transition off of it. Get your injury diagnosed, get it fixed ASAP so you can have a choice of where to go beltless or not, not just be stuck with a belt all the time. All right. Lastly, what kind of a belt is good? Well, I have my own belt company, drmikesbelts.net. Don't go on that website. That's not a real website. It may very well be pornography, so it's not safe for work. Here's the deal. It's a real good idea if you've never had a belt before to start with a fabric belt or a Velcro belt because it's easy to adjust. It's easy to get used to. It's not this crazy thing. If you start with a, like a real powerlifting belt, I mean, you can shoot a gun into that shit, it won't go through. And if you put it on really tight, sometimes it pushes up against your ribs, pushes into your hips, it hurts, it's weird. It really changes your your mechanics for lifting because it keeps that lower spinal segment super rigid and you may be used to some movement in there, which is fine. So as a transitional tool, a fabric belt is a really great idea. A reband makes a fine product. Um, Vallejo makes a fine product. Just one of those like, just like little belts that you can bend really easy. They're usually black in color and like about this wide. Get one of them shits, they're usually Velcro, and just start putting on a belt in training if you're into that sort of thing and you want someone out. And then eventually tighten, tighten, tighten. And then after a few months, you're tightening it really tight and you feel like sometimes when you really brace against it, the Velcro starts to slip and you're really comfortable, you're really used to it, that's when you're getting a lot out of it, but it's time to transition to a serious belt. And a serious belt is usually a powerlifting belt, and it's usually a certain width, certain thickness, and most folks interested in the very best results will transition to that belt. Bodybuilders included should be using a real serious belt if they're real serious about training in most cases. And especially a single prong belt is a good idea. Single prong belt means it has just one of these prong latches and then you close it just with a single prong. Why? Because if you're blowing all your air out and you're trying to close two prongs, sometimes you close one and then it fulcrums away and then closing the other is like mechanically impossible. So you have to peel off the one and try to guide two prongs in at the same time. Fuck all that. Single prong belt is like, you know, what is that like Reddit term? The master race of belts or whatever. Uh, single prong belt is is the shit. Single prong powerlifting belt, you put it on, get it as tight as you can or as tight as is comfy, and then all of a sudden it's easy to to, to put on, easy to take off, wonderful, wonderful product. Um, I have a super interesting custom made belt, which is double wide, because God decided to make me wrong and gave me like a six foot five person's torso with the arms and legs of a five foot three person. I'm, I'm five six in reality, guys. But in any case, I'm built all fucking weird. So for me, an extra wide belt works really well. I got it custom made by a company called Pioneer. Check them out on Instagram, whatever other media they have. Pioneer is awesome, super high quality products. I'm not sponsored. They don't pay me fucking shit. I paid actual real money for that belt, uh, but it's great quality product, great people that run it. So give a Pioneer belt or any other of the great companies in that space a thought. And uh, you don't have to get your belt super custom, although Pioneer does make custom belts, but just get a good belt. Make sure you got the Velcro belt first. Uh, it's weird to me when people have like, been training for two years and the first belt they get is like a reinforced like ceramic belt that they can't even move. And they're like, oh man, I guess I just got to wiggle into it. Like you should be wiggling the Velcro first. So take your time, ease in, use a belt for what it's good for. Don't use it for what it's not good for. And if you have any questions, comments, concerns, type them into the, uh, into the comments and uh, hopefully we'll make a follow-up video if anything is unclear. Guys, enjoy your belted lifting. Use your powers for good. See you next time.